Two hours ago on Friday afternoon, they departed from New York, with still an hour's drive ahead before reaching home. Their daughter Lisa had just been dropped off at her college campus to begin her studies. Nancy glanced at her husband Bill, who was behind the wheel of their Ford Transit, as they couldn't use Lisa's BMW 230i convertible to transport her belongings. Time really flies, Nancy thought, reminiscing about the day she found out she was pregnant on her high school graduation day. Bill was still in college pursuing his engineering degree. Both sets of parents were supportive, having known each other well and recognizing their children's love for each other. After Lisa's arrival, Nancy stayed with her parents until Bill completed his studies, and they married. For the past decade, Nancy had been a devoted stay-at-home mom, witnessing Bill's journey from a junior engineer to owning his own successful HVAC business. His relentless dedication led to significant contracts with construction companies. The house won't feel the same without her, Bill expressed with a touch of melancholy. She's always been closer to you than me, your little princess, Nancy responded. Indeed, she's our princess and deserves the very best, Bill concluded. Have you noticed how she's been acting lately? Nancy asked. She's been treating me terribly whenever you're around. She sticks to you like glue, sometimes even making fun of me. And when you're not here, she locks herself in her room, avoiding me completely. Oh, Nancy, she's still just a kid. Senior year of high school is tough, you know. She was under so much pressure trying to get into Columbia University. Try to cut her some slack, Bill said. I get that, Bill, but have you seen the way she looks at me when we're in the same room? Remember that incident two months ago when she came at me with a knife while I was sitting on the couch? I thought she was going to hurt me. I saw pure hatred in her eyes. You're imagining things, Nancy, Bill snapped. Nancy fell silent, not wanting to escalate the argument further. She didn't want Bill to get angry, not now. Taking out her phone, she sent a text message, we'll be there in 30 minutes. A minute later, her phone beeped. Is that from Lisa? Bill inquired. No, it's Betty. How's she doing with Paul? Last time at our barbecue, she was complaining about him working late nights, putting in too many hours, and prioritizing others over her. She should have known being married to a sheriff isn't easy. She should have thought twice before tying the knot, Nancy said, staying silent, hoping Bill would keep his cool until they got home. She leaned against the window, praying they were already there. As Bill pulled into his driveway, he spotted a sheriff's car parked in front of the garage. He parked behind it, and Paul, along with his assistant, stepped out to greet him. What's going on, Bill? Paul asked, puzzled. At the same time, Nancy hurried to stand behind the assistant, which didn't escape Bill's notice. This is the part of my job I hate the most, the sheriff said, handing Bill a manila envelope. William Thompson, you've been served. Paul, is this some kind of joke? Bill asked, his hand trembling as he took the envelope. He turned to Nancy, but she couldn't meet his gaze. Why, Nancy? What did I do? Bill asked. It's best if you go, Bill, Paul said. Get yourself a lawyer and work on your divorce. There's also a restraining order. You can't be near Nancy or come within 500 feet of her, Paul said last Sunday. You and Betty were at our barbecue for Lisa's farewell, Bill said, his voice rising. You both knew what was going on. You came, ate, wished Lisa well, and left with smiles. That's what I call hypocrisy, Bill. Please try to understand. What do you want me to understand, Paul? That you're a jerk? Bill shouted. And you, Nancy, you betrayed me, he glared at her with anger. If you didn't love me anymore, you should have just told me. I would have agreed to a peaceful divorce. The restraining order is already in place. It's best for you to leave now, Paul said, trying to remain calm. Bill stomped over to his van, angrily tossing the envelope onto the passenger seat. He slammed the door shut and then marched back to confront Paul. I need my stuff. I hope you're not going to be a jerk and stop me from going into my house to get my things, he said as he took out his house key and headed towards the front door. Your key won't work, Paul, said Paul, pulling out another set of keys from his pocket and handing them to his assistant. It seems you've thought of everything. Or was it Betty's idea? Bill accused. She probably arranged for a locksmith while we were gone. Am I right, Paul? Paul didn't respond just nodded at his assistant who led Bill into the house and stood by as he packed two suitcases. Don't worry, Paul reassured Nancy. 
I'll have my guys keep an eye on the place. It's not safe for you to be here alone for a while. Bill's really upset, and he might do something rash out of anger. I'll stay put. I'll call a friend to come stay with me for the weekend, Nancy said. Yeah, a friend, Paul muttered. Bill brought out the suitcases and placed them in the back of the van. The assistant gave Nancy the keys. Bill then opened the envelope and started reading the divorce papers. Bill, you got your stuff. It's time to go, Paul instructed. Hold on. This woman wants half of my business, half of our savings, the house, her car, and monthly alimony. Bill exclaimed angrily. Bill, if you don't leave, I'll have to arrest you, Paul warned, reaching for handcuffs. No need, Paul. I'll sign the papers now and disappear, Bill said, grabbing a pen and signing where indicated. Can you witness this and give me my copy, Nancy? Paul and his assistant were stunned. They never expected Bill to agree to the terms. Nancy smiled, feeling fortunate she got everything she wanted and was finally free of her husband and daughter. Paul signed as a witness and handed Bill his copy. Bill got into his van. Who is he? How long have you been with him? Bill demanded angrily. Go inside and lock the door, Paul instructed Nancy before approaching Bill's van. His assistant escorted Nancy inside. Don't do anything foolish. Think about Lisa, Paul advised Bill. I made a mistake marrying this witch. Bill yelled as he started the engine. She chose divorce because she knew I wouldn't accept an open marriage like you, Paul asked, shocked. Don't act innocent, Paul. It's common knowledge, Bill retorted. What are you saying? Paul's voice rose. Come on, Paul, we all know when you're working nights, your brother Tom is keeping your bed warm. Are you trying to turn me against my brother, you jerk? Oh man, she's cheating on you. Sorry to break it to you. Look, Paul, as a sheriff, you can tell when someone's lying. Go home and ask Betty, then you'll see, Bill said, backing up and leaving the property as instructed. Alone, Nancy poured herself a glass of wine and stood before Paniel's masterpiece, the train station worth over a hundred grand. He left it here, his loss, she thought with a wicked smile. She picked up her phone and dialed a number from her speed dial. Come on, Jason, answer your damn phone. Nancy yelled frustratedly before hanging up. He was supposed to come straight here after work, she muttered to herself, taking a seat and sipping her wine. Memories of their first encounter flooded her mind. It had been a year since they bumped into each other at the department store. He managed the shoe section, young and fit. She was instantly smitten. They exchanged numbers, and the next day she invited him over during his lunch break. He came and rocked her world, leaving her feeling like she'd been through a wild night. She couldn't deny the thrill of his energy compared to Bill's busyness. Bill always tired from work, spent his nights helping Lisa with homework before collapsing into bed, leaving Nancy unsatisfied. Finishing her wine and pouring another glass, Nancy tried calling Jason again, only to hear the same unavailable message. Frustrated, she tossed her phone on the couch and turned on the TV. But her mind couldn't focus. Opting for a shower, she recalled the intense weak old memory of Jason indulging her forbidden desires. He made it clear that her pleasures belonged to him alone. With a spare key to his apartment, she'd sometimes clean while he was at work, shower him with gifts, and even let him drive her BMW. Oh God, I need him right now. I'm so turned on. I need him to pleasure me, Nancy muttered to herself. She tried to remember the last time she'd been intimate with Bill but couldn't recall if it was three months, six, or even longer ago. It didn't matter though. She had her young lover, a real man who could satisfy her desires. They could be together without fear now. She was free, and he would move in with her that evening. After her shower, Nancy returned to the living room, grabbed her cell phone, and cursed again. Where are you, Jason? Why won't you answer the damn phone? Frustrated, she went to the kitchen and made herself a light dinner. Damn. I can't leave the house, or I would have driven to his place. Then something on the TV caught her attention. Rushing back to the living room, she turned up the volume and watched in horror as Paul, in handcuffs, was escorted to a police car. Sheriff Paul Anderson ended his wife, the news anchor reported. And then drove to his brother's workplace, where he ended him five times. Both the wife and the brother are passed. Nancy switched off the TV and sat down, shocked. Oh, Betty, I warned you to be careful, she cried. That night, 
she couldn't sleep at all. It was the first time she felt truly alone. Her husband was gone, her lover unreachable, her best friend dead, her daughter distant, and her parents deceased. The only one left was her sister, who lived 300 miles away with her husband, Tom. Saturday passed by with still no word from Jason. She felt both anxious and frustrated. He could at least leave a message to let me know what's happening, Nancy repeated in her mind. Sunday morning, she decided to drive to Jason's apartment. As soon as she stepped inside, she sensed that something was off. The walls were bare, electronics were missing, and his closet and bathroom were empty. She collapsed onto the bed. He's gone. He left without a word, Nancy cried. How could he do this? He was the one who suggested divorcing Bill and moving in with me, getting married after the divorce was final. She left the apartment and drove to the department store, hoping to find Jason at work. Instead, she met one of his co-workers who informed her that Jason had asked to leave work on Friday morning to retrieve his wallet but never returned. Later that day, he sent a resignation email to their boss. Nancy walked to her car, tears streaming down her face. Why did he do this to me? She sobbed. On her way home, she stopped at a gas station and was shocked to find out that both her credit and debit cards were declined. Frustrated, she paid with the last of her cash. At home, she drowned her sorrows in alcohol. Monday morning, she went to the bank and spoke with the manager. She was shocked to learn that there was less than $5 left in her joint account. Mrs. Thompson, your husband visited the bank last Friday and closed your joint credit card, the manager explained. He also informed us of your divorce and that he wouldn't be responsible for the mortgage on the house or your car anymore. That's a mistake. My car was paid off, and the house mortgage should have been settled, Nancy said, bewildered. We have paperwork showing a car loan and a second mortgage on the house for your daughter's university fees, the manager replied. But why is there no money in my account? Nancy asked. Your account was debited to pay the monthly mortgage, and there haven't been any deposits for the last three months. Whatever money was there has been used up. What about my husband's business? There should be monthly transfers from the company's account, Nancy inquired. Unfortunately, Mrs. Thompson, I can't share Mr. Thompson's account details or business matters with you. But if you don't make upcoming mortgage payments, your house and car could be taken back. But I don't have a job. I suggest you discuss this with your lawyer. Later, she checked the safe deposit box she shared with her husband. Only her jewelry remained. She took it all and put it in her handbag. Outside the bank, she tried calling Bill on his cell phone, but it was out of service. Perplexed, she called his work number, but it just kept ringing. Frustrated, she dialed Lisa's number. What do you want, witch? Lisa snapped angrily. Is that how you talk to your mother? Nancy asked, shocked. How else should I talk to you? Lisa retorted. You're the worst. You dumped dad like he meant nothing. I'm done with you. Don't call me again. I'm changing my number. Then the line went dead. Nancy sat in her car, stunned, gripping the steering wheel. Her thoughts raced as she tried to understand why Jason left without a word, questioning where her plan went wrong. She called her lawyer and secured a same-day appointment for the late afternoon. After your call this morning, Mrs. Thompson, we looked into your husband's company, her lawyer informed her. He filed for bankruptcy last Thursday before being served by you. The company is likely to be dissolved. But you said I could get millions last time, Nancy exclaimed. Please, Mrs. Thompson, try to stay calm. Just two weeks ago, there were no signs of financial trouble. Everything seemed in your favor. Now the company's bank account is frozen. And what about the car and the house mortgage? Last week, he used your house as collateral for a loan, again before being served. As for the car, when you signed the ownership document, you also signed for a loan in your name. This can't be true, Nancy cried. Mrs. Thompson, I have a personal question. Do you think your husband knew about being served? No, Nancy replied, looking thoughtful. He never saw it coming. She took a deep breath. So if I understand correctly, I won't get a penny from my husband's company. I have no money in the bank, and my car and house will be taken away. I'm afraid. So, is there any way to make him pay the mortgage, at least? His company was his only source of income, now that it's gone, he's penniless. Once he finds a job, we can make him pay you alimony. We had some investment certificates, 
but I couldn't find them in our safe deposit box. We'll check when he cashed those certificates and thoroughly investigate his company. We also need to locate your husband, his legal advisor is handling everything. Please proceed. One thing, Mrs. Thompson, these extra services will come with added costs. How will you cover the expenses? Nancy hadn't considered the financial aspect, but then she smiled. I have a valuable painting. Great. Get the money and write us a check so we can get started. No problem. I'll call you soon. One more thing, Mrs. Thompson. In the worst case scenario, be prepared to leave your house. You should start looking for a new place to live. At home, she sat in front of Panyao's masterpiece. I wanted to keep you, but because of my husband, we have to part ways, she said to the painting. Then she called her sister. Hey sis, I need a favor. You know I'll do anything for you. Nancy, Bill and I are divorcing. What is this, some kind of joke? No, sis, it's complicated. I'll need a place to stay temporarily. Can I stay in your guest room? I'll explain everything when we meet. What about Lisa? How is she taking it? She's definitely daddy's girl. I'm the one who gets the blame. Is there any chance you two can figure things out, maybe see a counselor? I doubt it. I'm really sorry. There's no issue on my end. I don't think Tom would mind, and our daughter would be thrilled to have you stay with us for a while. Thanks, sis. I'll keep you posted on when I'll be there. Nancy ended the call. On Tuesday, Nancy visited a jeweler to appraise her jewelry. To her surprise, she was informed that all her pieces were gold-plated copper and low quality. She cursed Bill for giving her fake gifts. Then she hurried to an art gallery, where she met with an appraiser. I'm curious about the value of my Panyal painting, the train station, Nancy inquired. The appraiser carefully examined every detail of the painting. The train station is considered Panyal's masterpiece. It encapsulates a range of emotions from arrivals and departures to joy and sorrow, he explained. He placed the painting on an easel and illuminated it with a spotlight. Then he took a magnifying glass and began inspecting it closely. After a few minutes, he chuckled. Is something wrong? Nancy asked, puzzled. Wait, let me show you something, the appraiser said. He fetched his laptop, set it up on a nearby table, and pulled up a website with a few keystrokes. He displayed a picture of the train station on the screen, zooming in on the bottom left corner. You see here, there are a man and a little girl standing on the platform, watching a woman walking to the train with her back to them. The man looks very sad, and the girl is crying. I understand. So what? Nancy felt a bit confused. Now take a look at the same scene in your painting, the man said, handing Nancy the magnifying glass. Nancy glanced quickly at the bottom left corner and felt dizzy. In yours, both the man and the little girl are laughing and pointing at the woman, like they're teasing her. It's, it's not real? Nancy stuttered. Yeah, I'm sorry, but it's a pretty good fake. Oh my god, Nancy grabbed a chair and sank into it, feeling utterly defeated. I can give you two hundred dollars. I just want to hang it for my friends and clients to have a good laugh. Nancy accepted the offer and left, feeling shattered. Her phone rang, and she saw it was her sister calling. Hi, sis, Nancy said, trying to hide her misery. Don't call me sis, you witch, an angry voice shouted at her. What? Why? Tom got an email from some stranger, sent to everyone we know. It's a link to an explicit website. It's got videos of you with some guy, dated from a year ago till last week. How could you do this, Nancy? I. I, you did it in our bed and in some cheap motel room, the voice was furious. I have to explain. No need. You're disgusting. Tom doesn't want you near us. He says you'll ruin me and our daughter. We don't want you here. Go to your lover. The call ended abruptly. Oh my god, they found out. They've known all along, Nancy's face twisted in horror. What do I do now, she panicked. Everyone knows, the whole town. I have to get out of here, far away. Five years later, Bill sat in the front row of the church, reflecting on the morning's phone call. He kept it to himself, not wanting to overshadow the special occasion. He had just escorted Lisa down the aisle, glancing at the couple at the altar. He watched as his daughter said I do to her college sweetheart. His thoughts flashed back to the day Lisa called him in tears. 
he remembered sitting in his office when her distressed voice came through the phone. Dad, please come home, she sobbed. What's wrong, honey? Why are you crying? Bill asked, taken aback. Just come, Dad. I'm waiting outside our house, she pleaded urgently. Why outside? What's happening? Should I call your mom? Bill's mind raced with worry. No, don't call her, just hurry, Dad, Lisa insisted. I'm on my way, sweetheart. While driving to his place, Bill was getting anxious. All sorts of thoughts went through his mind. Why was his daughter not at school? Why was she outside the house and not inside? Why didn't she want him to alert Nancy? Was she injured? Suddenly, he applied the brakes with a roaring sound of the tires. He was going to run a red light. Keep calm. He told himself he knew Lisa was working on a project until late the day before. He even helped her and gave her some ideas. Together, they put everything on a PowerPoint file and saved it on a USB flash drive. Lisa was waiting one block down the street. Bill stopped the car, and she hopped inside. Please don't go to the house, Dad, okay? Lisa said. Tell me what's going on, Bill replied. He cut the engine off. I forgot my USB drive this morning while I was rushing to school. I got special permission during lunchtime to come home to pick it up. I found an old Honda in our driveway. I went inside the house and heard strange sounds coming from your room. I quietly walked up the stairs and peeped inside your room. The door was not fully closed. Lisa started crying. Okay, sweetheart, inhale, Bill said in a soothing voice. He stroked her back. Take your time. I saw a man. They were both without clothes. They had closeness. Dad, she's cheating on us. Lisa sobbed. Bill sat there in shock. He realized that his 17-year-old daughter knew what cheating was. Are you sure of what you've seen? He turned to face her. I recorded it on my phone. She used her phone to capture it. She then showed it to her dad. Bill's world stopped abruptly when he heard Nancy groaning, Dad, please get her out of the house. I don't want to see her anymore. She's not my mom. My real mom wouldn't do things like this. I need to consider it. What's there to consider? Just kick her out. It's not simple, honey. There are legal steps we have to take. Tell me, Dad, do you still want to be with her? Do you still want to sleep with her? I don't approve of cheating, but we need to understand why she did it. If it's a one-time thing or if it's been happening for a while or... We'll continue. Here he comes. Lisa pointed at the Honda driving away from the house, turning away from them. Let's follow him, Bill started the engine. They trailed the Honda to the store. They spotted the guy slipping on his work jacket as he left his car in the parking lot and headed toward the employee entrance. He works here. Looks pretty young, Bill noted. Age doesn't matter to me, Lisa replied, snapping some photos of the guy in his car. We've got one thing figured out, sweetie. I'll drop you off at school, then I'll swing back home, grab your flash drive, and bring it to you when I talk to your mom. She's not my mom, Lisa cut in, her voice sharp. I'll tell Nancy that you called me and wanted me to bring it over. I don't want you facing her alone. Not now, not ever. Got it? I get it, but why? Because I don't want her catching on that we're onto her. I don't want you accidentally letting the cat out of the bag in your anger. What's your plan? I want to be in on everything you're doing. I need to be kept in the loop. Promise? I'm going to install security cameras in our house. And sure thing, princess, I promise to keep you updated. I love you, dad. Lisa hugged Bill. Love you too. Now, take me to school and hurry back with the USB, my class is starting soon. Bill pulled into the driveway and entered the house. Honey, I'm home, Nancy hurried out of the bedroom, looking surprised. Oh, Bill, it's you. Who else were you expecting? He locked eyes with Nancy. I wasn't expecting you back so soon. Lisa called, she forgot her flash drive. I need to take it to her. He approached Nancy and caught a whiff of closeness. How about a quickie? A quickie? I'm a bit tired from cleaning, and I'm all sweaty. You wouldn't enjoy it. Plus, you need to get Lisa her USB. You're right. At work, Bill browsed the internet for the best surveillance gadgets and cell phone monitoring software. 
Later, he went to an electronics store and got everything he needed. He made a firm decision. He wouldn't touch his wife from that day on. True to his word, he shared everything with Lisa. Over the next three months, he gathered a lot of information. He learned all about Nancy's lover, Jason White. Jason visited their place almost daily, either in the morning when Bill was on the second shift or during lunch on weekends when Nancy was supposed to be shopping. She'd often go to Jason's apartment if he wasn't working. Bill discovered she even had a spare key. He witnessed Jason taking her with whole innocence. He also overheard Nancy and her friend Betty sharing all their secrets, including Betty's affair with Nancy's brother-in-law. One Saturday, Bill found the spare key hidden in Nancy's handbag. He hurried to the mall and had a copy made the next week. He went to Jason's apartment. It was in a rundown part of town with no security cameras, and the main entrance was left unlocked. Inside, he installed small hidden cameras powered by long-life lithium button cells. He also found all the expensive items Nancy had bought for Jason. Bill devised a plan to end his relationship with Nancy while causing them both considerable harm. He commissioned a goldsmith to create replicas of all of Nancy's jewelry, which turned out to be gold-plated copper. He also arranged for a fake version of Panyal, the train station, to be painted by a professional artist with specific instructions. Bill connected with his childhood friend Steve, who worked as a corporate lawyer. After explaining his plan, Steve scheduled a meeting a few days later. During the meeting, Bill met with Steve and his cousin Linda, an auditor. Who was highly skilled in her profession, he was straightforward with them. He aimed to legally dismantle his company and then manage it from afar. His ultimate goal was to have Lisa repurchase the company in a few years. Bill began meeting with Linda regularly, either at her office or for lunch. Linda, a widow whose husband had passed in a car accident, had a 10-year-old son and had not dated since her husband's passing. Over time, a friendship developed between them. One evening, Bill invited Linda to dinner and a movie, which she accepted. On that same night, Lisa stayed overnight at a friend's house while Bill pretended to work late. Bill parked his car in Linda's driveway and thanked her for agreeing to come. This is the first time I've been on a date since my husband passed, she said. I get it, Bill replied. I hope you had a good time. I did, Linda said. Can we go out again sometime when you're free? We work together, and you're still married, she reminded him. She kissed Bill on the cheek. Let's take things one step at a time. With that, she headed inside her house. Bill urged Nancy to switch her car, but she was somewhat hesitant because she was fond of her Lexus. However, when he suggested that driving a BMW convertible would make her look younger, she agreed enthusiastically. Since the Lexus was paid off, Bill sold it and received cash for it. Then, he secured a car loan for the BMW and put everything in Nancy's name. When Nancy signed the paperwork, she believed it was solely for the ownership certificate. Unbeknownst to her, among those documents were others. That would later cause problems for her. A couple of weeks later, Bill noticed that when Nancy goes to the bathroom after being intimate, Jason would leave the bedroom without clothes and go to Lisa's room. He brought it to Lisa's attention, and she was extremely furious. They decided to put a camera in her room. What they discovered was alarming. Jason would open a drawer and take Lisa's underwear. The same afternoon, while Nancy was sitting on the couch, Lisa came behind her with a knife. Had Bill not intervened at that moment, Lisa would have harmed Nancy later in the evening. Lisa told her father that she would not have been in prison had she and Nancy, because she was still a minor. Bill wasn't surprised when he overheard Jason persuading Nancy to divorce him and take him for everything he had. But what the couple didn't realize was, that Bill was already ahead of them. He knew Nancy often let Jason drive the BMW and even have closeness with her in the back seat. He also knew when Nancy consulted a divorce lawyer recommended by Paul, and he was aware the lawyer would investigate his company and assets. Waiting a couple of days, he took out a second mortgage on his house to cover Lisa's full tuition fees. The next day, he filed for bankruptcy, timing it so that Betty would change the locks on their house when they were away in New York during the barbecue party the weekend before Lisa left for college. Both Bill and Lisa played their parts, Paul and Betty acted as if nothing was wrong, with Paul even helping Grill. No one would suspect they were plotting against them. On Friday morning, while Nancy was in the bathroom, Bill grabbed her phone and sent a message to Jason, I'll be at your place by 8. I want you to do me in the backside. Before I say goodbye for good, hurry home and get ready to screw, babe. 
I'll tell them I need to run errands. Don't call or text back. I'll leave my phone at home in case they check. Catch you later, my future hubby. After sending the text, Bill erased it and slipped the phone back into NY's purse. Little did Jason know, as soon as he walked in, three guys would ambush him, beat him, and force him to resign via email. Then they'd make him tell his landlord he's moving out. After drugging him, they'd clean his place, remove the spy cams, and loot everything, making it look like he left. They'd wrap him up and haul him off in a van, disappearing without a trace. Bill would keep it all under wraps, a secret he'd take to his grave, hidden from Lisa and Linda. Friday afternoon, after getting served, Bill checked into a motel. He chuckled while watching the evening news before dinner. One of the guys from Jason's place swung by he handed over all the cameras and got paid no words were needed he didn't spill about. Where Jason's body ended up buried, either Saturday morning Bill ditched his old phone, got a new one, and gave his new digits to Lisa. He then headed over to Linda's pad. There, he spent all his time sorting through and editing the video footage. He blurred out Jason's face to avoid any link if Jason went missing. He crashed in the guest room and bonded with Linda's kid. Bill and Linda kicked off the final step of their plan where an elderly couple from Seattle would buy the company. Turns out it was Linda's relatives. No one on staff would lose their job. Monday, Lisa called, saying Nancy was on the hunt for him. They both had a laugh. Later, Bill posted all the videos on a raunchy site using a fake email. He sent the link to everyone they knew, even NY's brother-in-law. He stuck around Linda's for three more months until his divorce was sorted. They kept dating but kept it PG. Linda made it clear no touching till Bill was officially single. Bill agreed to keep his marriage vows until the end. Staying at Linda's had its perks. If there were any inquiries, Bill could say he was flat broke and crashing at Linda's until he got back on his feet. On the day of the hearing, Nancy didn't show up in court. With the house and NY's car already taken away and Bill being broke and out of work, the judge quickly granted the divorce without any spousal support or splitting of assets. NY's lawyer didn't argue against it. Later, they crossed paths in the hallway. You're quite the strategist, Mr. Thompson, the lawyer remarked. Am I? Bill responded with a furrowed brow, then walked off. Back to the present, Dad, pay attention. Oh, sorry sweetie, what were you saying? It's time for the father-daughter dance, and everyone's watching, but you're not moving. My mind was somewhere else, princess. Bill took his daughter's hand, spun her around, and they began dancing to the music. Now, I've got to dance with your mom, Bill told Lisa when the song ended. And I promised. My little brother he'd be next, Lisa said with a smile. Bill approached Linda and asked her to dance. Later, Bill went to the bar and ordered a whiskey. Sitting down, his thoughts turned to a phone call he had received at home in his bedroom. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. I'm Dr. Henry Dusa from Dallas, Texas. It's about your wife. What's wrong with my wife? Bill asked, puzzled. She's in the next room right now. I mean Nancy Thompson. Bill hadn't heard that name in five years. He sank onto the bed. Go on, doctor. I'm a psychologist, and I'm treating my patient, Nancy Thompson, in her final days. Her final days? Yes, Mr. Thompson. Do you have a few minutes for me to explain the situation briefly? Yes, go ahead, said Bill, bewildered. Your ex-wife shared her life story with me, from her childhood to when we met. She said you were the only man she knew until she met Jason, a big mistake she regrets. She talked about planning the divorce and what came after. She believes you knew about the affair and set her up. She's come to terms with losing you and your daughter because she knows she was in the wrong when she left town. She only had $200. She wanted to get away from everything, especially after the video recordings of her affairs surfaced. She hopped on the first bus and ended up in Texas. She found work as a waitress in a city bar by Interstate 20, mostly frequented by truckers. The owner gave her a cheap room in exchange for favors. After a year, she became pregnant and had to resort to a risky termination without proper medical care. Later, the owner started forcing her to have closeness with the truckers for money. Some used protection, but others didn't. By the time she went to the hospital, she had severe STDs and AIDS. She's very sick and knows she's dying. Her last wish is to see you before she passes away. I'm really sorry to hear that, doctor. My daughter's getting married today. 
I'll reach out to you next week. Don't wait too long, Mr. Thompson. Here's my direct line number. Hey, honey, take it easy on the drinks. You're driving us home later, Linda hugged her husband and gave him a sweet kiss. You mean the world to me, darling, Bill pushed his glass aside. I'd never risk your safety or our son's. Let's hit the dance floor. I want to feel you close, Linda whispered. A few days later, Bill dialed Dr. Duza from his office, regretfully informing him that his packed schedule prevented him from journeying south. Dr. Duza proposed Bill speak with Nancy via phone, he arranged for a connection to her hospital ward, where a cordless phone could be brought to her bedside by a nurse. Bill, is that you? Nancy's voice quivered. Yes, Nancy, it's me, Bill reassured her. Oh, Bill, Nancy's voice trembled with emotion, I'm deeply sorry for the pain I caused you and our family. I'm now facing the repercussions. Nancy, I've forgiven you. I've moved on and found happiness, Bill paused, gathering his thoughts. In fact, I owe you gratitude. Since our separation, I've remarried and have a son with my new wife. Lisa regards her as a mother, and they share a wonderful bond. Just so you know, Lisa tied the knot last Saturday. The ceremony was lovely, and her stepmother ensured everything was perfect. We're eagerly anticipating our roles as grandparents, Bill heard Nancy weeping softly on the other end. Amidst the background noise in Nancy's hospital room, he patiently waited until Nurse Angelica intervened, Mr. Thompson, I apologize, but I must conclude the call, and the line fell silent. As Bill glanced at the family portrait on his desk, a smile played on his lips. He who laughs last, laughs best, he whispered to himself.